All right, folks, this is Nathan, and uh, we are in the booth of, that's right, you guessed it, we're in the booth of Truth. And, yeah, we're in the book Our Threatened Freedom by R.J. Rushduni. We're in Series 3, Part 8, and let's go. It. Are you a human being? The question, are you a human being? may sound facetious and trifling, but it is less so when we read what some scientists are saying. For instance, Nobel laureate Sir Francis Crick said, No newborn baby should be declared human until it has passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowments, and if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to life. What a bastard, what a complete monster. Anti-God monster. And if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to life, live. And if it fails, and if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to live. And if it fails these tests, ah, oh, sorry, See, I'm having difficulty getting started. And if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to live. Another Nobel laureate, Linus Pauling, wants to see every person's genotype tattooed on their forehead. Now, if you and I ever made statements remotely approaching these in their moral madness, we would be shunned by all sensible people. However, when Nobel Prize winners make them, they're published and serious attention is given to their remarks. In all this, a moment... Uh, in all this... In all this, a monstrous evil is apparent. These scientists see man as simply another laboratory animal or guinea pig for experimentation. As a matter of fact, human beings are used for experimentation, especially mental patients and some still-living aborted babies. Think about it. If scientists can be so callous toward human beings, why should we expect better from street hoodlums? muggers and criminals? Why should contempt for human life be morally wrong in a criminal and yet legitimate in a scientist? If something is legitimate for people at the top of any society, you can be sure that it will soon be practised at the bottom. A sad fact about this fallen world is that sickness is contagious in most cases, but good health is not. A man can catch a cold, the flu, and a variety of diseases from people around him, but he cannot catch good health. The same is true of evil principles and standards. They are highly contagious, because man is by nature given to evil, and he has a natural affinity for it. Is the day coming when Sir Francis Crick's hope will be realised, and none of us uh, it's a misprint. Is the day coming when Sir Francis Crick's hope will be realised and none of us will be declared human beings unless a scientific committee tells us that we qualify? The answer to that question is, very clearly, yes, that day is coming, as long as we continue our present course. Not until we return to a biblical faith can we arrest that trend. If we do not believe that man is created in the image of God and solely to be governed by God's law word, then nothing can prevent our lives from being expendable. Then we are human beings only if some scientist says so. But we are not the creatures of science and the scientists, but the creatures of Almighty God. He made us and he governs us. 
He defines us, and no man has the right to challenge his definition. If men dare to challenge God's definition of man, they will pay a price for it. No man has the right to deny the status of man to any other human being. It is God-given. All right, well, that's coming in strong. Mic position matters. Mic, mic. Nine. Are parents being abused? We hear a great deal these days about child abuse, but much too little, or nothing at all, about parental abuse. Make no mistake about it. Parents are abused. About a century ago, psychologists, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts. Psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, 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 psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts began providing everyone who messed up his or her life with a very convenient excuse. My parents did it to me. Granted, more than a few parents are very poor parents, but the foundation of all sound moral systems is that whatever is other may... Blah, blah. is that whatever others may do to us or for us, we are personally responsible for what we are and do. An excuse, however, was provided by these men. My parents did it to me. Some educators, not all, got into the act. Their excuse for failure was the family, the parents. Is Johnny doing badly or is he a problem at school? Don't blame Johnny. Blame his parents. They are doing too much or too little. Whichever it is, they are all wrong. Sociologists, child welfare workers and the courts got into the act. One idiot judge once remarked that there is no such thing as a bad child, only bad families. In other words, no one is a sinner and all children are dear angelic innocence until they grew up and become parents. Then, suddenly, they are the root of all evil. Parents are so abused today that we can be grateful that a strong, natural urge impels people to marry and to have children. Otherwise, with all the abuse parents get, it would be an unpopular calling. On top of that, our courts are beginning to side with children in some very ugly situations. If you strike your child with just cause to chastise him, you can be in serious trouble. If he files a complaint against you. You can be in serious trouble if he files a complaint against you. Some school counsellors urge such children to file a complaint. However, if your child defies you and strikes you, Savagey, the welfare workers, counsellors or courts may well side with a child. Parents are abused on all sides and their love and work is underrated. No one but a father or a mother has the patience and love which rearing a child requires. There is no healthier environment for any child in the family with its parental love and patience. Again and again, when God in the Bible wants to tell his people how great his love for and patience with them is, he compares himself to a husband or to a father and mother. God's images of his love are drawn from family life. All this abuse of parents is a deadly evil. It is destroying the very foundations of life and it is creating social conflicts and disorientation to an unequal degree. When the Ten Commandments call for honouring one's father and mother, the promise for obedience is a long and good life for individuals and nations. 
In other words, parental abuse is a ticket to a short life for many nations and for a civilization. But what are we doing? In many states, there are legal efforts underway in the courts to remove the Ten Commandments from public buildings, courtrooms and classrooms. Keep the religion separate from politics. Blah, 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 blah. Wow. Yes, the singing was awesome. Yes, 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 you're welcome. All right, let's do this and take a break. Ten. Does freedom work? One of the important aspects of American history was the original intention to establish a country in which the basic governing principle would be freedom. The Founding Fathers were aware that their beginning was far from perfect and they were unhappy at having to compromise with slavery. They wrote in the abolition of the slave... Huh? They, they wrote in the abolition... They wrote in the abolition of the slave trade and expected slavery itself to disappear before too long. There were other problems, of course, and American history has been anything but trouble-free. To depend on freedom as a solution can be slow at times. It means that people must learn and apply the answers rather than having them applied from the top. It means, too, that evils sometimes linger longer than we would wish. However... The expectation was that problems could be best solved by a free people rather than by a powerful monarch, ruler or bureaucracy. This reliance on freedom as the basic instrument of governments made the United States the envy of the world. Immigrants poured in from all over the world and they continue to come in because this seemed to be the land of opportunity, the land of freedom. By World War I, the United States was the envy of the world and the dream country for many peoples. Travellers found that, even in very remote countries and places, people had some knowledge of America as a golden place. Since then, of course, that dream has tarnished. Our follies have made us unpopular and even hated. Here, at home, our belief in the governing value of freedom has been steadily replaced by a belief in control by the federal government and its bureaucrats. Some years ago, Lin Yu Tang wrote that, before he came to the United States, what it meant to him was Patrick Henry's great declaration, Give me liberty or give me death. And coming to this country, he finds that we now had another slogan, Give me security or give me death. Of course, the ultimate security system is slavery. Freedom did not fail. We failed. Freedom requires work, character and responsibility, whereas a security system requires a slave master and a slave state. An old American principle was that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. That statement came originally from famed Irish orator and leader John Philpott Curran, 1750-1870, who, in a speech of 1790, said, It is the common fate of the indolent to see their rights become a prey to the active. The condition upon which God hath given liberty to man is eternal vigilance, which condition, if he break, servitude is at once the consequence of his... Servitude is at once the consequence of his crime and the punishment of his guilt. Few have said it as well as Curran. He was right. The choice is freedom or slavery. Either we make freedom and the responsibility it involves our way of life, or we be enslaved to an all-powerful totalitarian state. 
In more than one country in Europe, various forms of social security are bankrupting the nation when bankrupting the nation bankrupting the nation while increasing the power of the state. No politician dares call a halt to this insanity and these nations stumble from crisis to crisis. Will this soon be said of us? I've n- I, Curran, I don't know Curran. I, um, my ignorance is of not quite infinite, but it's in the suburbs. What do you call the fella? John Philpot Curran. Oh yeah, I'm going to check him out on Wiki Wiki Wee Wikipedia. All right. No wonder is he on Facebook. <laughs> John Philpot Curran. Cork. Ah, he's a Corkonian. Bye. It is the common fate of the indolent to see the right become a prey to the active, the condition upon which God hath. Corkonian. Cork, bye. It is the common fate of the indolent to see the right become a. Rights. Rights, bye. Something like that. That's silly. I'm just being silly. Eleven. Whatever happened to love days? What are love days? They certainly were not hippie love-ins nor anything modern. Love days appeared some years ago to be replaced by something which is far from good. Love days used to go by a number of different names depending on the region or the country. Love days is the English term. Each language in Europe had its own, wherever the practice occurred. Love days were a means of settling quarrels and disputes between people without going to court. They were once common in village and country life. In some areas, the law required people to observe love days. Disagreeing parties were required to come together in a public place, air their grievances publicly and then settle them, sometimes with the help of a person known as the odd woman, a woman whose work it was to arbitrate such conflicts. In some centuries, the community required it. If either party expected anyone to have anything to do with them, they had to settle their differences. On market days, the two quarrelling parties were required to lock arms and walk up and down the entire marketplace, chatting as friends all the while. It was the community's way of showing that all such conflicts was deadly to the community and had to be resolved. Instead of aggravating the conflict, the community moved to resolve it and to deny people the luxury of creating dissension. We need love days now. If people quarrel... Instead of others working to bring peace, others take sides and broaden the quarrel. They get in the telephone to gossip about the trouble and to flan, flan. I flan the flames, flan in the flames. They get on the telephone to gossip about the trouble and to fan the flames. They get on the telephone to gossip about the trouble and to fan the flames of discont... (laughs) Dissension. They get on the telephone to gossip about the trouble and to fan the flames of dissension. We have become an extremely litigious people and all too many such disagreements wind up in the courts. All this says that We do not believe in a free solution, only a coercive one. When we bring in the state as a referee, we confess our inability or our unwillingness to resolve the matter in freedom. The situation is equally bad if we do not go to court, as we then prefer a permanent quarrel to peaceful relations. Some forms of the love days had a requirement by law that people resolve their problems. 
many did not. It was the moral force of community which required it, not the state. They believed in the words of St. Paul. Be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. 2 Corinthians 13.11 The next time you hear about a conflict or quarrel in the community, remember this. By your retelling of the story, or your relish in gossip, you can make a trouble day, or even a war day out of it. However, if you refuse to fuel the conflict, and instead call for a peaceful and godly solution, you can help restore love days, and also restore the work of freedom to human relations. All right. Oh boy, I was silly. Making fun of Cork accents. After all, not everybody can... Hmm. This is going to go on longer than I thought. What is happening? 12. What's the purpose of taxation? Most of us, while we may complain about taxes, rarely doubt the purpose of taxes. Most people will say that we must be taxed in order to support the various branches of civil government. This is what we were taught in school and, like some other things we were taught, it's wrong. It may have been true at one time, but it is increasingly false. L. L. Fuller, in his Stores Lectures on Jurisprudence at Yale Law School, published in 1964, noted that even then the purpose of taxation had shifted. The morality of law... The morality of law... The morality of law, 166. Taxes had become a means of social control. They are used to control business and the business cycle. The allocation of economic resources... <coughs> the allocation of economic resources is governed by taxation... Women are taxed by means of a high tax on all cosmetics, so that a substantial amount of the price women pay to enhance their appearance is a tax on women's desire to be beautiful. Taxes are used to identify professional gamblers and to make people pay for the use of alcohol. Travel is discouraged by high taxes on every kind of transportation, from the gas pump to the cost of an automobile to the price of a plane ticket. Taxes are often imposed for no other reason than to increase the power of the federal government. We are taxed because we are alive. We are taxed when we die. As I warned my wife, neither of us can afford to die right now. But this is not all. Professor Fuller says of the taxpayer, May he not ask himself what, after all, is the difference between a tax and a fine? His mood of quiet desperation is not likely to be improved if he is unfortunate enough to learn that a famous justice of the Supreme Court of the United States used to insist that there is no difference. 166b. In other words, we are being fined for being alive. In brief, the purpose of taxation is increasingly to limit self-determination. Taxes work deliberately to limit your freedom. Taxes, which began as a means of supporting the government, are used to limit our self-support. We are justified in saying that if there is no difference between a tax and a fine, when... Mm -hmm. No difference between... Then taxation has become immoral. We are therefore taxing, because of this view of taxation the good citizen more heavily than the poor or bad citizen. 
we are finding success as much or more than we find criminality? Is it any wonder that people are bitter and cynical about politics and politicians? Most Americans love their country and would like to be proud of it once again, not disgusted nor ashamed. But what else can be expected when we are more tender to our enemies than we are to our own people? All too often, it seems as though our federal government has declared war against we the people, and taxation is its nuclear weapon to blast us with. How long can freedom survive in such a situation? Nuclear weapon! Thirteen. Do our judges make sense? In November 1980, the Washington Monthly called attention to the growing irrationality of many court decisions. For example, the U.S. Court of Appeals recently ruled that the police can search a paper bag without a warrant, but a zippered leather pouch cannot be searched without a warrant. The US Supreme Court has given a series of strange decisions regarding aid to parochial schools. According to these decisions, tax funds can be used to supply textbooks to parochial school students, but not to parochial schools. However, projectors and maps cannot be supplied at all, and guidance services cannot be on school grounds. All this is supposedly in the name of the First Amendment. Why are maps a violation of the First Amendment and textbooks are not? Do the judges know something about textbooks and maps of which the rest of us are ignorant? In a Kansas City case, a civil servant was operating a private business on government time and with government... Good for him. And with a government secretary to do it, the man's defence was that this was routine practice among federal officials. A jury found him guilty and he'd resigned. The judge, however, soon thereafter overturned a jury verdict on the grounds that The judge, however, soon thereafter overturned the jury verdict no, 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 Let's do this right I had some weird pronunciation Blah, blah. A jury found him guilty and he resigned. The judge, however, soon thereafter overturned the jury verdict on the grounds that criminal intent was lacking. The civil servant then asked the Merit Systems Protection Board to reinstate him. An administrative judge not only ordered his reinstatement but also stipulated that the man was to be rewarded. Ah, shucks, man, what have I done? There we go. Oh, um, like a splurp. An administrative judge not only ordered his reinstatement, but also stipulated that the man was to be awarded $20,000 in back pay. The man, by the way, not only pleaded in his trial that everybody was doing it, but also that his job did not make much time. Uh, Okay, the camera's about to go. But also that his job did not take much time, so he used the vacant time for his own business. The law... uh, Why did I not just do something? Pardon me. (laughs) 
The law and its judges cannot command respect if decisions, as well as laws, are irrational, unreasonable and unfair. When the law and the courts make a judgment, it is necessary for that judgment to be right and just to the people if law enforcement is to flourish. However, when people weigh the law and the courts in the balances of justice and find them wanting, there will be serious unrest in a society. Daniel tells us that the fingers of a man's hand appeared in the wall of Belshazzar's palace to write a sentence of final judgment. Mini, mini, tekel, a parson, that is, a judgment stating that Babylon's days were numbered, it was weighed and judged. Daniel 5, 25-29 Now, increasingly, that same judgment is being written on the minds of many Americans as they see the direction of our laws and courts. The foundation of freedom is righteousness or justice. If the law begins to represent instead a form of injustice or unrighteousness, the law itself will be judged by both God and man. Solomon said, Righteousness, or justice, exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14.34 Today, all too often, our laws and courts are a reproach to... are a reproach and an embarrassment to us. They have parted company with justice. They are instruments too often of injustice and power, not of justice and freedom. Alrighty, alrighty. It's your boys Nathan's head. Stoop down. Yes, yes. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is a bit longer than usual, but what can you do? So thanks very much. Um, if you believe that this work, uh, this is part of a project to, um, project, project, to um, get all of Rushdini's published works, borrowing a couple of books, up onto Audible and other platforms in audiobook format. If you believe that this work is important and uh, is a ble- could be a blessing, is a blessing to many, possibly, then consider going to www.nathanteacher.com. It's written down below there. Forward slash donations. Good idea. Good idea. And you can make a tax-deductible one-off or ongoing gift or give a gift by PayPal there. So thank you very much and hope to see you soon.